just um, <laughs> points here uh, in mentioning the um, women uh, <coughs> suffragettes in the United States uh, going through a long struggle to get the vote, and they got the vote uh, after a very long struggle, but they got the vote only when they accepted to draw the inclusion of black women. I think this starts an important point here in what democracy is all about and for whom. And the Berkeley movement, I think you, you mentioned, you know, youth involvement and change and so on, but there was Vietnam as well. Oh, yes, there was. Okay. And that was like the center around which that fire grew. Uh, the Hammurabi code, uh, of course, it's um, a code of law written in stone, literally, um, which is very important because it established that notion of law and order for um, nations, states. But it simultaneously reaffirmed class structure mm -hmm. because uh, slave women in that code, and it's written on, in stone, were to be hanged if they dared to cover their faces because this was the prerogative, veiling was a prerogative <coughs> only of aristocratic women. <coughs> so I think we need to de-idealize, which I think you tried to do, but I'm adding just a little detail. Um, de-idealize the, uh, the beginnings of the roots and foundations of democracy, of how it also built in But the poet, in all, the poet also said that uh, in war, you could not capture women and then force them to marry. Oh. Right, right. I mean, it has that, but it's... Uh, also, the other side. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, yes, uh, um, there was a very interesting introduction to the evolution of democracy, human rights, and rule of law. Uh, so uh, I think that is a very optimistic perspective that um, with the future we are going much more mature and better and better off. But um, uh, when we come to the level of, of a business and an execution, um, we adopt a different uh, uh, approach uh, uh, that the growth is the discontinuous uh, process. So it's not evolutionary. There are some discontinuities in, in this process uh, caused by, uh, by the way uh, we used to think. Uh, so first of all, um, uh, there was a group of uh, Swedish scientists with whom uh, we worked on, on strategy development and, um, and implementation. And they pointed out the, uh, the role of myths and wishful thinking uh, in strategy making. So as long as our, it, it's nothing objective, it's something that is based on our beliefs, convictions, legends, that, it, what, that we build a picture of, of the reality. In reality, that may be, the reality may be not uh, exactly like, uh, like the myths that we create about it. And the myths have uh, their own life cycle, so they are not for, forever, they are not lasting forever. But uh, um, so, so we should understand their logic and, um, and uh, their pace. Uh, if it's going uh, to the situation that the myths do not explain uh, the contradictions, tensions, uh, conflicts, and, and so on, it's the time for revolution, for breakthrough. And uh, with this uh, breakthrough, uh, we have to, uh, to, to deal with it very carefully. Uh, first of all, you have to, uh, we have to forget as fast as possible the old myths. Because they do not explain anything, they do not help towards uh, achieving the progress. And the next step uh, will be consolidating around the new ideas and reinvention of new myths that will consolidate uh, social groups, uh, politicians, and so on. And uh, if there is a strong situation of conflict, uh, they, this discontinuity uh, has a destructive uh, uh, impact on, on everything, on all those values uh, that, uh, that we should uh, stick to. Uh, so this is also the lesson that we, uh, <laughs> we have in Poland for, <laughs> for, uh, for some time uh, already. Uh, but I think that is, a, is a the general uh, attribute of human uh, way of thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Eric. 
and then the puppet. <coughs> yeah, I wanted to refer to your, to your remarks, uh, Gary, uh, why neoliberalism came to the forefront. Mont Pelerin, uh, uh, Hayek, uh, the controversy with Keynes already in the 30s. Uh, so I think the main reason for the switch to neoliberalism was the abundance of capital in the world and the uneven distribution. For example, we have in the United States uh, established the financial markets in the 80s because banks didn't know what to do with the money. So they liberalized the financial markets all over the world and after the breakdown of the communism, they spread also in every coin of, of the global uh, economy and society. And uh, uh, you know, these uh, initiatives, for example, in Europe to have a big state, also in Western democracy, Keynesian policy uh, was not successful because the state had too much uh, uh, capital needed for these programs. And then uh, everybody said, it is not the state, but the private uh, actors, not only the financial markets, but also the multinational concerts. And they spread over the, the, the uh, global sphere. So I think what is important now is uh, how can we manage globally a more dis uh, equal distribution of this abandoned capital we have? So one question is, should we give these capitals at least uh, partly to the un less developed countries in the south or maybe in the east, Africa and so on? And I think this question uh, has to be solved in a manner that we should not rely on autonomous financial markets, but we have to uh, govern in a certain context uh, uh, and transferring abandoned capital from the developed countries to the best, less developed countries which poses enormous problems because uh, they are not allocating uh, their financial means really rationally in many ways. Just corruption and other things, uh, the structure of the governances in the developing countries is rather poor. It's rather poor. There's no democracy, even if we think about that they have democracy, uh, so democracy has to be changed in the developed world and in the developing world at the same time. Well, um, uh, for me, th this um, uh, with, uh, you started your, your introduction with words confusion, um, uh, opacity. We didn't, we didn't talk about opacity, but see, when we don't see the future. Well, this is uh, clearly, um, uh, this confusion is, um, means that there is, um, uh, a, this is a time of bifurcation, or it seems, it seems a time of bifurcation. And what is a bifurcation in, in, in terms of systems, and, uh, in terms of the world? Uh, it is a change from one path to another one. Uh, the thing is that when people are in, in the bifurcation, they cannot see what's coming. Because if it is a real bifurcation, you know, the two paths are possible, right? And the system oscillates. Sometimes go this way, sometimes go the other way, and so on. And the example you gave in 1795, how could one see what would be the future? Nobody could see what would be the some guess, you know, but by chance it could, could be right. Or, you know, but nobody <coughs> could see that uh, uh, we would get the exhaustion of France and the British Empire. Nobody could see that at that time. 
after, after that, and now we look backwards and we see, well, it was clear that that could, could, could happen. It was real, and it really, it really happened. But at the time, it would be very difficult to, to, to foresee. And the transitions, these uh, bifurcation time, these oscillations, may take 30 years, 20 years, 30 years. That is the, the lapse of, uh, of one generation. Uh, in fact, uh, in Europe, we, 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 our, in our history, we see that uh, these times of change in the past uh, two or three centuries have elapsed like uh, 30 years. You know, the 30 years war, every, in every century, they have been uh, sort of a long war um, of 30 years who has changed the, 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 the given um, what, what the given players, in fact. It started with the Thirty Years' War, then we have uh, the, the, the war of the, the, of the, um, uh, of the Spanish uh, um, succession, then in the 19th century, at the beginning, we have Napoleonic Wars, and in the 20th century, we have two world wars. Now, what was the effect of the two world wars? Was, in fact, again, a bifurcation, where the system, in fact, um, sort of dropped off Britain, British Empire, finally, and uh, <coughs> the hegemony of the United States uh, appeared. What, what is this bifurcation? Is it something of the sort? Well, there is probably, uh, as people say, there's a, an, effort, an elephant in, in the room which we don't see because we cannot and we don't want to see it. But maybe this is probably one, one of the the path. It is, you know, uh, the loss of, of hegemony of, of, of the United States. But there is other path, which is transformation as well, somewhere else. So it, it's really, uh, how can we guess? Only by understanding what's going on and talking systematically with people. Right? So for instance, what's the, what can be the role of, uh, of the World Academy? Well, engage more people from East Asia, not necessarily China only, but engage people from East Asia and talk with them. You see, if if you'd be here, listening to what we, we think, what 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 are what are the visions that we have about the world, about the future, maybe we can get a glimpse of of if something is mature, or if it is very far away and not not not, not coming, because really we cannot. From that, we, we just, you know, the long trend, in fact, we see continuously the adaptation and the transformation of capitalism, right? We see that. It will finally end, because uh, capitalism is also a, an historical product. But, you know, uh, what it has been announced continuously, it will probably end, it probably will continue. But the system, it's, that's what we are worried about. It's our loss of uh, power uh, that that we, we we only grasp by by trying to understand that and by by seeing what's in other people's minds. Uh, I'll just give an example. Um, sometimes people get very worried, but that's very pessimistic. Well, just look at the Netherlands. Right? Netherlands was at the center of the world system in the in the 17th 18th century, right? Then it lost that position to, to Britain and the United States, but it continues to, to be a, a rich country, wealthy, uh, where people have quality of life and things like that. So there is no no no, no drama in uh, uh, not being any longer the the hegemon, right? The world continues, and you know un unless there is some foolish thing or a meteorite falls. Or, or something like that. Uh, we, we must really um, try to, to, to understand. You know, first to understand and then to act. Always. <laughs> Gary, uh, I must say that when you talked about the future, uh, about the, the young people, and uh, that uh, they will fix all the problems and that they will live in the ideal democratic system, it reminded me. I don't think I said it in that way. No, you said it. It sounds very good. That reminded me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That reminded me. Brusho. 
Nikita Khrushchev, who declared that in 20 years we will reach communism, and this generation showing our young people will live in the communist society. Unfortunately, that doesn't work like that. Because first of all, it's not that I do not trust young people, but I do not want just to be politically correct. Because it's, it's become a political correctness. Young people yeah. will do all the things. No, they will not. And I will tell you why. Simply, I, I will tell you an example. There is a, a, an excellent French historian, Artois Tong, uh, and uh, he wrote a book on uh, the regimes of historicity, how we approached history. In the past, there was always the memory of the gold age. It was always in the past. After enlightenment, it was idea of progress and everything was in the future. And somewhere after the crisis of the two world wars, the humanity moved into the regime of which he calls presentism. All the past and the future are subjugated by the present interest. And we live in this. We live in this, and they live in this. And in addition to that, history is never done today. Because to, I don't know, I'm not a mathematician, but I can tell you that largely it was already done yesterday, the day before yesterday, maybe a hundred years ago, and maybe a thousand years ago. So we are only changing the price that we pay when we enter the future. And that's what we can do. I want to say regarding this old evolution, it looks very nice, but at the same time we should not forget that the initial uh, idea of participatory democracy which existed in uh, ancient assemblies because of uh, the states or the cities or empire like Roman Empire has become too large, uh, it was the idea of the uh, representative <coughs> democracy which was born already in the 10th, 12th century in Italy, by the way. Uh, and uh, 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 England, of course. Well, uh, what I'm aiming to, uh, we are moving to something else. It does not mean that representative system will be with us forever. As it has changed before, now, and uh, John Keane, one of the guru in the democratic uh, thinking, coined this term, it, it is already, we are entering monetary <coughs> democracy, meaning that many social society groups monitor what's happening in politics, and more and more groups gain more and more clout of influence on, 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 the, uh, uh, on the developments. And therefore, I think that gradually we are moving into the direction of the deliberative uh, democracy. Because after all, today, what we, we are doing? We have two or three groups of elite fighting each other for the power, and we simply cast the vote for one, one of them. It is not a democracy in pure term. Mm -hmm. While monetary democracy gives us opportunity, and uh, deliberative democracy, which is coming, will definitely bring a lot of features from the initial idea of democracy into the process. And to, uh, to finish, uh, uh, I do not believe, I, I think that we should not mix world order and state. Because when we are talking about state, democracy, is a political regime of a state. It's not, we can of course descriptively, descriptively <coughs> use it for international, but what do you mean by that? Yesterday somebody was, was talking that it is uh, not good when, uh, you know, uh, uh, several countries, large countries have a voice in the, uh, as permanent members of the Security Council, while the rest do not. Yeah. How do we then do that? 
I do not understand the basis of this democracy. Let's do it one uh, person, one vote. Then China will be the leader of the United Nations and we will be living like China wants. Do we need that? No. So I think that we should not mix these categories. We can talk about world order, how to make it more you know, just or whatever. Even we could say democratic, but to the notion of democracy, it doesn't have any, have any uh, uh, relationship. And uh, finally, I think that you used the date not, not good, I mean 1795. It was already clear what was going to happen in 1970, uh, in uh, 1793. Because in uh, 92, Robespierre, Grand Terror has started. And it was already clear by 94 when Robespierre was beheaded himself where it all goes. So uh, we can uh, see uh, the immediate trends, but we can look. We can't look over the horizon. Thank you. Okay. Uh, very interesting, and to add uh, <laughs> one more bit of complexity, I think uh, that uh, there are several blocks, or uh, you know big uh, uh, deterrent to evolution uh, of uh, democracy, human rights, uh, and the rule of law. And uh, one of the many is, uh, I think, uh, in uh, the blindness uh, that uh, hits uh, people that uh, have uh, good uh, intention, uh, but are blind uh, to the simple law of the social construction of reality. And uh, as there are truly, as you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, problems created by the process uh, of rising expectation, but there is not much uh, understanding uh, that the rising expectation uh, are the creation of the nation and government, like the United States is a great example. They want to be loved and show they are so good and they are better than anybody. And in so doing, they lose the trust. They're so blind. You know, the more they want to be loved and propose the whole board how they're nice. We're going to Iraq for democracy. We're taking down Gaddafi for the love of democracy. Who's going to be so stupid to believe that? Except the people that say some blatant lies. So actually destroying all the good work they do. Now, on personal experience, sometime my government, Italy, has asked me to at my institute, not me personally, but uh, to check and uh, supervise uh, the, and Italy gives uh, not uh, so much, uh, but uh, millions and millions uh, every year to the so-called uh, developing country. Now, Italy, but it's even worse for other countries, but I know for sure about Italy, really does, uh, in many cases, a good job uh, and uh, is a uh, really honestly trying to help. But the people of that nation eh, would not uh, like uh, Italy to hear what they have done eh, because the money Italy has really spent, but it goes in the pockets eh, of the rulers, eh, not to benefit. In other, other times, eh, it goes to build the cathedral in the desert. You know, per se, if you take a picture, wow, what an but it's totally unrealistic to have spent the money and built that uh, <laughs> factory in the desert <laughs> where there is no electricity or running water. <laughs> and uh, worst, uh, a fraction of that help uh, is really <coughs> terrible because uh, it's an uh, outdated uh, medicine, you know, pharmaceutical product that uh, cannot be sold in Italy. Is a, 
expired uh, can admit that uh, you know you would be arrested uh, but through corruption uh, Italian firm uh, dump uh, on people that are starving food uh, that is not eatable and that uh, would uh, hurt them so Italy in the coffers has spent uh, millions only 10% uh, of those millions that are dirty millions they are not charitable are just uh, you know cheating <laughs> morals uh, you know and so uh, you know the law of rising expectation creates a great trouble and uh, another you know number of uh, democracy is that usually blind they promise uh, too much uh, that they're willing to deliver. It would be much more believable and honest to say, for now we can go like this, uh, because life is hard, uh, difficult, uh, abundant. Uh, and so, and also, how stupid then, uh, from democracy, not to do, you know, benchmarking with the organization that are dictatorship. You know, that's uh, evident uh, how democracy, with all the flaw, is 1,000 better than a dictatorship. But dictatorship, uh, interestingly enough, uh, some at least, uh, are very well uh, apt uh, to do PR and convince uh, democracy, a large part uh, of the population, that their cruel dictatorship are worker paradise uh, and, you know and that's well, that's a, a, an interesting uh, aspect that, that we need to understand more thank you i just like to come back to a point on expression used by eric my friend eric who spoke of abandoned capital this worries me and it intrigues me that capital belongs somewhere and I would suggest that it be restored to the productive economy where it properly belongs, i.e. to the pockets of those who create welfare and value, the wage earners. Okay, thank you. I want to come back to the, the, the original topic, to the evolution. Uh, if you look at the evolution history, uh, democracy and any other system, we should not assume this is the linear program. This is the spiral that we're going back and forth, we're jumping steps. So this is something what we need to uh, be aware. And then, uh, I mean, the paradigm shift. We should, of course, I agree with Alexander to some extent that we cannot rely, you know, the top line. Khrushchev did, you know, the young generation. But the young generation proved many times they were, they changed the paradigm. Yeah, yeah. Period. I mean, after living 45 years, uh, in, I mean, uh, 40 years in, 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 in the communist system and then 30 years in the US, I still have some Soviet way of thinking, you know, it's deeply rooted, you know. I mean, it's, uh, you know, this is something what the next generation will uh, phase out, you know. I mean, uh, this is something what we need to uh, be aware. And this is the hope, you know, that you will learn uh, from us. And then, then the, 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 the issue is, which is coming again and again, and this and the other component, this is, um, you know, I agree with Gary's conclusion that, that uh, freedom, uh, individual or business, without limits is bad, but you need to think particularly, like talking from the prospect of Central Eastern Europe, who are longing for freedom for 40 some years, 45 years. And we knew from our parents, grandparents, <coughs> and they, of course, presented us idealized uh, picture of freedom before Second World War. So it was a big pressure to have a freedom, and then, um, also not for individual, but also for academia, for enterprise. Look, you know, 
1939, Estonia and Finland had the same, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, level of GDP. Estonia may even a little bit higher. When they started transformation in the 90s, the, the GDP in Finland was uh, three times higher. Poland and Spain had the same uh, uh, GDP as Spain in 1950s. And then we entered the European Union, Spain had almost three times higher. I mean, two and a half. So it, this is the economic freedom. So this we need to keep, you know, that was not only. But we didn't have enough discussion and, uh, you know, uh, to, to show the limits we, in the Polish French government when Barcelona well. So the neoliberalism didn't come from Washington. <coughs> I, I am getting mad, you know, when everybody is complaining on Washington consensus. It reminds me the situation that everything was prepared in the in the in the sixties, uh, fifties, uh, forties, uh, seventies, you know, uh, came from Moscow. Of course, they were the, 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 the center of decision, but we had a lot of also flexibility to, to do this. So our neoliberal program, uh, Balzerovich development, did not come from Washington because we were working during the martial law, you know, uh, uh, in prepared this when a uh, long few years before Washington was here. So somehow we need to uh, keep in mind, you know, that there were grassroots movements and <coughs> movement. It shows that the, the development is much more complex process as we think. Thank you. Thank you. John? Yeah, um, just on the point of the evolution of, of uh, democracy, but more specifically on the evolution of governance, and, and also what Jao was saying about a, a bifurcation point, um, it seems to me that, that if you look back through human history, we have a sort of interplay between the scale of an economy and it's always moving ahead of governance, and governance is always having to catch up. And then the scale gets bigger, and governance has to get bigger. And so we've moved from, from hunter-gatherer uh, bands to bigger tribes to bigger middle-aged small states, city-states. Now we've got bigger nation-states. And now we're <coughs> fiddling around with supranational states like the EU. But, but the, the bifurcation that we're really talking about now, it seems to me, is um, is transcending and including the nation state within a broader, more global kind of cooperative government system because we are facing global problems like climate change, but also the global problem of rampant, out of control neoliberalism, mm -hmm. which um, although it was started deliberately, our biggest mistake would be to think that we can, that, that individual nation states can stop it individually, no. It's out of the bottle now. Any nation that tried to stop it on its own, capital would just go somewhere else to carry on as before. Hence, the only way to bring back the sort of social democratic kind of uh, uh, ethos will, will be global. However, uh, and I think Alexander is absolutely right here, democracy is the wrong focus when we're talking about the global level, because you're never going to have democracy in China anytime soon or in a number of other countries. Democracy is definitely the focus at the national level. How can we improve it at the national level? But when we're talking about the global level, we need to think about how can we make global agreements more effective. Any comments? Kaka. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gary. Um, I would like to uh, disagree with uh, Dr. Rock and uh, Alexander regarding youth participation uh, and youth's future of uh, these processes. I just have uh, two very concrete examples of uh, how we can like continue uh, vision years talking about this. Number one, when I get, when I came as a rector two thousand eight, I had a, all my faculty members, all Soviet style professors and academicians, all of them. And then in one single week, I fired all of them completely, just threw away, right away, and hired uh, very young. 25 to 28, 29 years old PhDs from European and American universities. And you know what, ha what happened? We are now number one school not only in Georgia, in the whole region. But Russia has the same problems even still today, and they have this old style 
Soviet professors who teach still a communist, I mean, who taught communists before and now they teaching market economy. And I'm not continue because we can have a long, long discussion with you on this. And second, second point, when, so, I mean, when ex-president Saakashvili came to power to Georgia, our age of ministerial age was 28 to 29. And he changed the country in eight years. We, have, we were a failed country, actually. After Shevard Nazar, Georgia was a failed country. Corruption was no state, was nothing. And uh, after nine years of his presidency, and now we have a, a well-functioning democracy and well-functioning country in economic and political agreement. Even though Russia tried to occupy us, and actually still is occupying us, but still we do have a country who runs in a proper way. So two good examples of how youth can be in the future and how youth can change everything in, in society. And I think it's many applied for in many ex post soviet countries in this, on, on our table. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to jump out of order and ask Ivana next. Uh, okay, so I think it's uh, it's really important to think of the uh, of the path and the, the the way democracy is going to go, because uh, uh, in the middle of that, if uh, we think about the individuals and the youth and the people who are going to live this democracy. Uh, we, need to, uh, we need to think what are the uh, main uh, associations or, or inputs that uh, youth has when they think of democracy. Is it, like, is it something that uh, uh, allows them to be disresponsible for the society or for the other people? And, uh, or is it something, so we have to really think of uh, main notions of democracy, considering countries. I think sometimes we get really lost because we forget uh, of the main tools that democracy delivered, uh, such as like we know what are the democratic systems considering the, for example, like um, security sector of the countries. So the dem democratic countries should have, should have more civil included uh, control of the security sector and included all other sectors like financial sectors and uh, which will include civilians. And uh, so I think the democracy already uh, developed these tools, but we kind of forgot. So they're, they're the, the principles which should be respected. But what is really important is how democracy is going to be perceived from uh, the individuals. And is it going to raise from them some um, uh, values of uh, responsibility and the values of responsibility towards the state, towards their neighbors, towards everyone. So that's some, probably some kind of idealistic model, but uh, uh, it's really important to think of the, of the simple values of, uh, of the moment. Thank you. Uh, benchmarking of dictatorship mm -hmm. of democracy. My experience about Madagascar, but I would like to to, <laughs> to speak up in the liberal uh, in the next uh, session. What I would like to say is just when we're talking about views about about well, all this kind of, the, I think the mainstream is gap and expectations, and uh, when the gap is too high then it, it leads to the struggle, what Gary was saying. So I think what for us it's important is how to like bridge in the gap and without use and without appropriate tools and without, I mean, et cetera, et cetera, we can build up this bridge. So I think this should be one of the in the core of our discussions later on. Thank you. Thank you. Mommy? Mommy? Uh, I'll just be very brief, just a form for one for one French philosopher. Mm -hmm. But before that, I heard Georgian uh, uh, professor. It, it is really for discussion. Yeah. It is for discussion. I know that at that time, they even changed the president of National Academy and brought a guy from States. But let me come There is no uh, academy. Let me come there is no academy, academy in Georgia anymore. <laughs> Castle, we don't need it. Let, let's <laughs> take a look. I just want to quote. Uh, French philosopher uh, Jacques Ellie, sorry if I pronounce it wrongly, who wrote, quote, in my view, our Western political institutions are no longer in any sense 
democratic. Mm -hmm. we, are the, uh, we see the concept of democracy called intervention by manipulation of the media, the falsification of political discourse, and the establishment of a political class that in any country where it, ex it is found simply negates democracy. Thank you. Just with one word, ben benchmarking. In democracy, if you want to create value, benchmarking is everything. Mm -hmm. uh, evolution, uh, human rights, and rule of law. Uh, as we agreed, or oh, I think, that the, <coughs> some human rights are jeopardized by different processes right to live, property rights, and others. A rule of law, what does it mean on national scale? What does it mean on international scale? Second thing. Third thing, capability of uh, democra democracy as, if you think it about as a uh, uh, procedure of making decision. Is it adequate? <coughs> what can be improved within procedure uh, from the point of uh, uh, information, from point on timing, uh, efficiency, etc.? Et and uh, fourth, responsibility of those who are involved today in the procedure processes of making democratic decisions on different scales. Do we have, uh, do we have uh, uh, enough capable decision makers within such a process? Can we I improve it through the, in the voting process, like, uh, like uh, primary uh, decision or Personalize of the decision, not to in input the decision maker, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Responsibility, accountability, and transparency. Okay? Uh, uh, and we don't see those things, we know that democracy is going to be very imperfect. Finally, uh, the American Constitution, Roosevelt felt, uh, felt, was incomplete because he didn't have a Bill of Rights for Labor. Uh, they did publish the Bill of Rights, but he died, and Truman didn't have the guts to put it together. <laughs> Thank you.